The technical briefings occur at lunchtime every day. Uh, today we already had one and it was about the post-2015 sustainable development goals. Now, there are two pieces to this. Our first guests are sitting down, but I get to talk a little bit longer. There are two pieces to this. Uh, first, there was the Millennium Development Goals. So they were started in 2000 and they were to carry us through 15 years of progress so that countries were working together toward common goals uh, to help guide global efforts to end poverty. Joining me now to talk about this piece of it uh, is Dr. Thies Broma, who is the Director of the Department of Measurement and Health Information Systems here at WHO. You noticed I had to read that, right? All it means is he's very smart, okay? We also have Dr. Ariel Pablos Mendez, the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID. Tease, let me start with you. The MDGs have been good for public health by all accounts. And recently the Director General said, and I quote, they have focused political attention and generated badly needed funds for many important public health challenges. Talk about that for me. Okay, so maybe it's good to take stock now. We're in 2015 of the MDGs. Where did it bring us in the past few decades? So in 2000, targets were set for 2015 for a few health goals. Child mortality, maternal mortality, and infectious diseases. We're not quite at the end of 2015, but we got a pretty good picture of where we are. And we just published the World Health Statistics 2015 to take stock. So just a few highlights, because first of all, I think we should keep in mind that the progress has been spectacular. We did not meet all the targets, but it's been spectacular. Child mortality was cut by half since 1990, from 90 to 46 per thousand. That's an enormous reduction, has never ever happened in history. Pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, malaria, dramatic reductions. It didn't meet the target. The target was two-thirds reduction. Maternal mortality also cut in half. Dramatic uh, reductions in the numbers, but still 300,000 women dying every year from complications at delivery and, 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 and after delivery. The target was three-quarters reduction, so we didn't meet the target, but an unprecedented decline. Then the infectious diseases, HIV, TB, and malaria, the goal was to turn around the epidemic by 2015, meaning that the new cases should have gone down from what it was in the past. It did for all three diseases. For instance, for HIV, the peak was around 2001. Now we're much lower to, but still 2.1 million new infections every year. So in terms of the MDGs, they've generated enormous momentum around these goals and everybody has been following progress towards these goals in countries, regionally and globally. So in that sense, the MDGs were a big success. If you have any questions for Tees or for Ariel while they're sitting here, go ahead and send them in through Twitter. It's hashtag social good or hashtag WHA68 and we'll go ahead and ask those questions for you. Let me ask one follow-up question on that. You said in some cases the targets weren't met. Was this a case where the targets were overly ambitious to try to make progress? Or were there other challenges? Well, the targets were ambitious, definitely. And I think that's been good because they really drove the international community first and then also countries to do the maximum possible. Many countries met the targets for many indicators and uh, that, that's great. Other countries had other situations like fragile states or lack of economic progress or poor decisions on health policies that didn't lead to the, uh, to the success that we, we were anticipating. I think there's one other thing that I, I must highlight. The MDG agendas did not have equity very clear in it. Mm. So focus on the poorest. It was a very much focused on national progress. I think if we look forward, we really need to address that issue that equity needs to be very central and we focus on those that are suffering most. Ariel, let me come to you now. You'll need to pass him your microphone. Uh, give me some examples now. Let's go to more of a global picture here. Give me some examples of what the global community has been able to achieve because of the MDG accomplishments. Well, thank you very much. And I join this in the assessment that the gains in the last 20 years have been spectacular. 
uh, whether it's the number one MDG of cutting poverty in half, it has happened already before, ahead of time. And half the worlds that were low income in the year 2000 have now moved up to middle income. And that is a marker for the whole of the development success of the last 20 years, which is important for health as well. And you attribute that to the MDG work? Well, clearly, what the MDG is, it's the first time we had in history a consensus, a soft consensus, because it was technically grounded, but it was not directed, right? It was an aspiration, an ambition, that a, it's almost like a, an open source a music, right? Nobody was truly dictating or holding your hand. It was, this is the music we want to see in the world, in, uh, and the world, NGOs, private sector, governments, foundations, bilateral donors, agencies, everybody moved in their direction without anybody controlling mm -hmm. it. It's quite a, it's an nice impressive picture. thing. Yeah. But indeed, it brought the world with a single consciousness. I, I remember that when, when, uh, the men went to the moon and they took the first photos of the of planet Earth and they appeared in the magazine, uh, the Almanac in the United States. It gave you a sense that we were all in it together. And I think the MDGs gave us that in development. So because of that, we have made many of the points that, that uh, this has made. We have cut in half maternal mortality, cut in half HIV infection, cut in half pretty much uh, a child mortality and it's an area that because of the success and the speed you will imagine it gets harder right if you yeah. the lowest hanging fruit it gets harder and harder well the rate of decline in child mortality is accelerating compared to about two percent per year annually decline we now have almost four percent per year in in the world this is quite an impressive yeah, story yeah. i believe that family planning has been very very important as well mm -hmm. A family planning not only helps save lives of mothers and children, it empowers women and it does a lot of good things for health and development. And then it brings a demographic dividend as well that has contributed to the economic improvement. So the economic improvement has come from many, many forces, but clearly uh, the demographic dividend, thanks to family planning, has been also quite crucial. I want to ask both of you, did, did the accomplishments made through the Millennium Development Goals exceed your expectations at the beginning? Ariel, since you have the microphone, you can start. No doubt. When, when USAID was established just over 50 years ago, there were nearly 20 million children dying every year. 20 million, right? Wow. Or thereabouts. The world has doubled or tripled in size, yeah. and the number of kids dying by 1990 came down to 12 million. Now, around 6 million. The success Amazing. that we have seen in our generation in our lifetime has now emboldened us to see what we see as a grand convergence that the levels of mortality in the world will now approximate those enjoyed in the richer world that will mean that although there will still be some deaths because we have deaths even in rich countries the deaths should be less than two percent in a world that gives about 130 births million of births uh, a year that will still mean two million deaths not zero but that is our goal, the all of to end preventable child and maternal mm. death by 2030 means this grand convergence of the levels of mortality with the richer world, and it's already happening. Mm. We're almost 80% of the way there, or 90% of the way, we will end preventable child and maternal death in our generation. Wow. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Tis, what about you? Well, I take it from the numbers perspective, because that's, that's my, my job and passion. <laughs> so every time, a country does a national survey, a demographic health survey, or the, I open the report and the first page I look at is the child mortality decline. And every time I was surprised whether it was DR Congo or Ethiopia or any other country about the enormous declines in child mortality. It was just so striking. So in that sense, I have to admit, I was really surprised. I think we've also seen quite a large growth in funding that went into key health interventions for child maternal and the infectious diseases in countries. And so what it tells us also is that more money can make a difference. And I think that's uh, this can-do lesson I think we have to take forward. So it, it, it's, it, 
in 2000, I would not have thought that we would be in this place now. Yeah. Ariel, let me ask another question to you. Where does the focus need to be now? Finishing, what, finishing this in 2015, plus also looking forward. Where, where does the focus need to go? Well, obviously you like the idea of ending preventable shadow yeah. maternal death, so we're going to do that. And we also have to continue to contain infectious diseases, both the classical and also emerging uh, uh, pathogens. The world is looking at non-communicable diseases and injuries, which is one of the few causes of death age adjusted that is growing in the world. Um, but importantly, as we see the end of preventable shadow maternal death, a grand convergence, that would be, if you think of it, in terms of inequality between countries, that will mean the end of those between countries inequalities. But within countries, there will be a lot of inequalities, both on the income part and in many of the health indicators. So we see also a within country revolution in the future, mm -hmm. both to address the inequalities in health and as well as mobilizing domestic resources rather than dependence on international assistance to get this done. So one of the aspirations in the post-2015 era is universal health coverage. Make sure that the bottom half of the population have access to uh, a, essential services and that people do not have to go broke because they have to pay for health in the world. That's an aspiration that we can deliver. And given what we have done so far, we feel very confident. Because the economics of countries are improving in in many of the countries, we also see the need to reorganize the financing in a better way and to bring in new ideas as to how we're going to finance health in the future. In, in the countries that still need for that grant convergence to occur, ideas like the global financing facility for every woman, every child will be important and part of the new post-2015 era. You know, I'm going to have T stay with me in just a moment. He'll be here for two blocks from now, but I'm going to lose you, so I want to ask you one more question. You just sure. mentioned the idea of financing uh, these types of investments. How do you do that? How do you ensure that you've got the investment that you need uh, in, these type, in, the, in the work that brings us to these types of goals? Well, clearly results is a good thing, right? Yeah. In, in a way, we are moving from an era of debt to an era of life. We were before just painting picture of the dying kids and now we're showing you we can end preventable child maternal death. That's possible. And it's going to be about thriving and surviving. Now to do so also the economies will change. While uh, the international community remains quite generous and the American people has been one of the leaders in, in investment really in, in many of these areas. Uh, we expect countries to do more. And so we are looking at the economics of countries, their GDP is gross, their taxation, their uh, total expenditure, what public, what private, and how we can bring together resources locally to address these needs. Domestic resource mobilization and transparency will become fundamental to financing health and development in the post-2015 era. In ideas, for example, in the year 2000, many of the poor countries were drowning in debt and their societies were collapsing because of AIDS in Africa. Now Africa is one of the fastest growing regions in the world. They can now see their financial growth and their economic growth. And you see, hey, could we not work from that future to save lives today? And the answer is yes. So we are creating mechanisms that will allow us to borrow from the future, to address needs today, country owned, country half owned by the countries, half paid by the international community, bringing private capital to all sort of innovations in financing. And uh, indeed, uh, at the end, is organizing all of in a way that will be sustainable and fair. Tees, let me ask you one follow-up question. We're going to get into the, the financing aspect of it a little bit more in your next segment. Uh, it's not right after this, it's two from here. Uh, so we'll dig deeper then, but, but I'm curious from your point of view, both of you have mentioned the need to focus on finishing uh, the commitments that we've made here in keeping this moving forward, sustaining this. Uh, what would you say of the eight current goals in the Millennium Development Goals, uh, what would you say is the one that needs the biggest push still? Perhaps it's made the least amount of progress. Perhaps it has the most to gain. You can pick the reasoning why, but what is the, the, the one you would say we absolutely need to put a full court press on? Well, if I go by the annual discussions that we have in the World Health Assembly here, it 
the topic that always stands out is maternal mortality, which is MDG5, where we know the interventions are there, where we know it can be done, but still uh, 300,000 or so women die every year. And, and that of, is unacceptable, and that is a priority. Now, there is some good news here, and I think that the post-2015 agenda can capitalize on that. In the last few years, look, me opening these reports about how many women are delivering in facilities, for the first time in decades, more women are delivering in health facilities in almost every country that mm. I've seen, which is really a big achievement because it's stagnated for decades. Now the challenge is to deliver the quality care to those women and make sure that they are there in time. So I would pick maternal mortality reduction as my number one. You like how I didn't ask you that question? <laughs> but, but you're going but it, in. It's a great, it's a great question. <laughs> and uh, we actually have been looking at in each of the priority countries in which USAID supports, about 24 of them. And we, there's a tool, a Johns Hopkins tool based on data that T's and others put together, called the Life Saving Tool, which allows you to calculate. If you put a dollar, where will that give you the most bang? Oh, really? What is the most feasible? based on what other countries in your region and income status have accomplished, what is possible, and how much does it cost to reach that optimal status. And when we did that across our countries, lots of things are important, as this has mentioned here, many vaccines and everything is important. But the one thing that jumps every time is investment in family planning. Mm -hmm. It jumps every time. Family planning alone could help prevent 30% of the maternal deaths, 25% of the child deaths, empowers women that allows to improve health for the rest of the family and the communities. And as I mentioned before, it brings on a demographic dividend of 2% of GDP growth compounded over 20 or 30 years. So, but even just based on the life safe part of those three big outcomes for family planning, it, it comes ahead as one of the most important things we are doing and the world needs to do obviously more across everything but if you're asking one thing that will yield the most yeah. the the models are very very clear actually all right thank you both for joining thank us you. errol i'm gonna let you go tease i'm gonna let you slip off the set but i'm gonna ask you to stay close i'll take that thank, thank you, you very, very much, much.